Thank you very much for this lecture series. And today's lecture topic is opportunities for the application of quantitative models in the fully integrated software system by Ilan Balta and Monica. Here in a minute. Uh, before we start, I just want to go over the asking questions um, in policy today in today's event. So usually um, we have these developed speaking events in downtown Berkeley, the auditorium, uh, open to the wide public. And that, uh, since COVID, uh, I think this must, might be the first uh, you know, person into this uh, wall. Uh, we do have a few people who are joining us on Zoom as well. And uh, it's hard to tell what the numbers are because they're all going through our uh, little, um, website. And uh, in the auditorium, you can just raise your hands. I hope that's okay for you to talk. And otherwise, please enter your questions in the Q&A. So this time, talking to people who are in Zoom on the control panel, and they will address as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. So we have sort of a lecture, and then we have a question and answer session. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I am Shafi Kalosa. I'm the director of the Science Institute. Just a few words about the Institute. Uh, given the public nature uh, of this lecture series, it's an international venue for collaborative research in the University of Science and the Science in 2012 with a very generous grant from the Science Foundation and bring together uh, world's leading researchers in theoretical computer science and other fields who uh, benefit from theoretical computer science and vice versa and to explore essentially the use of algorithmic thinking and uh, science, engineering medicine and studying the laws of computation itself. And one of the explicit goals of the Institute is to expand the horizons of the field by uh, exploring other scientific disciplines uh, through sort of algorithmic and, scientific and the computational lenses. And the insights uh, gained from such explorations often relate back to the field itself. I think today's lecture is a great example of that. Um, and, uh, our distinguished speakers are Noam A. Balda, and Noam A. holds an MD from Tel Aviv University, a PhD in Public Health and Computer Science from Ben Gurion University, and a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at the Open University in Israel. And he completed his postdoc in uh, Public Health in the Department of Biomedical Informatics at, um, actually, the Department of Biomedical Informatics in Harvard Medical School. And he's the head of the Real World Evidence Research and Innovations Lab at Tel Shomer, a hospital uh, in Israel Medical Center. It's actually largest Israeli hospital and co-heads the digital healthcare laboratory in the Department of Software and Information System Engineering at Ben Gurion University. It's very young looking. And um, it's old, but it looks good. And Noah, and Noah uh, Gunn holds an MD and an Master of Public Health from the Hebrew University and a PhD in Computer Science from Ben Gurion University. And she completed her postdoc in the Department of Medical Genetics at Harvard Medical School. Now she's the director of the AI driven medicine uh, department at Khalid uh, Innovation. She tells us about Khalid actually in the talk, Khalid Research Institute, and she co heads the digital health care laboratory in the Department of Software and Information System Engineering at Ben Gurion University. And also, and um, I think you are done. But in any case, uh, health insurance in Israel is mandatory, as people might know, and um, it's very comprehensive and it's a list of uh, services. And, uh, so this uh, is one of the HMOs, I think uh, we can call it an HMO, and has a tremendous amount of uh, data and it's very uh, kind of, um, innovative in how it's using this data. So I'm looking forward to your talk and um, is very quite a bit of ground to cover so we'll keep a brisk pace it should be fine because it's not a very messy lecture uh, so this is the premise the premise is that significant significant advancements are being made in computational methods that could be beneficial to healthcare some of which we've seen over the last a uh, few days, but generally speaking, it's hard to bring these methods to bear. There is a so-called implementation gap of which much has been uh, said. And a lot of this gap stems from uh, needing very specific circumstances to bring these uh, algorithmic advances uh, to bear. We will aim to show 
that a fully integrated healthcare system is well positioned to take advantage of uh, computational tools to benefit healthcare. And we will do so by just showing certain recent uh, achievements that were made in the fields of causal inference and predictive modeling over the last uh, two years in Israel. So this is the outline of the talk. I'll start by talking about uh, the data which uh, we'll be using and the healthcare system in Israel in general. Then I'll talk about informing medical knowledge through causal inference, and then Noah will uh, uh, carry on with uh, predictive modeling. Okay, so let's start with the uh, Israeli healthcare system. In Israel, health insurance is mandatory. It's been that way since 1995. Everyone, every permanent resident is eligible for a very wide and generous uh, services basket. That's how it's called. It's not tied to payment. So you can avoid paying your medical bills. The government will come after you to collect the money they're owed, but you'll keep getting a, a healthcare. It's provided by four per provider uh, health organizations, which are called, that's just how they're called, sick funds. That's our HMO. And uh, individuals can just switch freely between the different uh, sick funds. There is no uh, 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 discretion. They have to accept everyone. But in reality, few people do actually change. Most people just stick to their uh, sick fund. Uh, of these health organizations, Klalit, which is the one we'll be discussing today, is the loudest. It uh, ensures 52% of the Israeli population. Then there's Maccabi and two others. And these health organizations are not pure insurers like most American health organizations. Rather, they are mostly providers. They directly provide most of the services they have to. So they directly provide primary care, specialist care, labs, imaging, and drugs, and usually indirectly provide hospitalization. Thanks to some smart people that were in office about 20 years ago, uh, um, Israeli healthcare has been digitalized for a long time. And this gives us very good longitudinal uh, data. All of the health organizations pull all of their data into large data lakes that uh, seamlessly connect all the different facets of a person's healthcare. And each person has a single unique identifier. So there's no siloing. It's all uh, uh, to, together with one another. And it's also interfaced with governmental system. So things like demographics, which the sick funds are not generally aware of, rather the government is, the information is shared with the sick funds by the government on a day-to-day -day basis. So as we'll see much further down the talk, this allows the sick funds, for example, to be able to map family relationships throughout Israel, because we know everyone's parents, we know everyone's siblings, we know everyone's children. Kralit Health Services, which is the one we'll be specifically talking about today, because this is the data that was used for all of uh, this research is the largest one. It has 4.7 million insured patients. Historically, even more than other six funds, it directly provides most of its services. So it buys less and directly provides more. And it also owns hospitals. So, uh, it doesn't buy services, it also, but it also directly uh, provides hospitalization services. So the last facet is the COVID-19 data because will be focusing a lot on, on the COVID-19 pandemic. Israel was unique in being very early to mass vaccinate, I think the first in the world, by uh, late 2020, and it was the first to provide boosters. It used almost exclusively the Pfizer vaccine, very little Moderna, uh, and all the information is, was, and is collected centrally by the Ministry of Health. So uh, things like who gets vaccinated, who gets tested, who's positive, who dies because of COVID-19, who gets hospitalized, that's all co collected centrally by the Ministry of Health and shared with the different health funds. So all of that was the integrated healthcare part of, of the title. Me trying to make you understand how this amazing data that I'm about to show you uh, is collected, but let's let's start with the scientific part. So I'll be talking about how we made use of this data to inform medical knowledge through a uh, causal inference. When the COVID-19 pandemic broke out, and, and even more so once vaccines started in, in late uh, 2020, suddenly there was a, a, there were a lot of causal questions that needed 
very quick answers. So all of us, everyone, the medical community, the scientific community, but generally everyone uh, needed to uh, know, to get answers about the effectiveness of vaccines, direct and indirect. I'll, I'll explain these uh, terms later. We needed to know if the vaccines are safe. We needed to know the answers to all these questions for children, for pregnant women, and for other uh, subgroups. We very quickly had questions about waning immunity from the vaccines. We had novel variants, still have, regrettably, novel variants, uh, which we needed the uh, answers for, and more and more. In medicine, specifically, but also elsewhere, when there are causal questions, the first line to answering them is randomized clinical trials. Randomized clinical trials, which as their name suggests, for those not familiar, are um, controlled experiments, interventions, in which the researcher controls the assignment of treatment and it does so using randomization. So who get, for example, in vaccination, who gets vaccinated and who doesn't, that's something that is randomized. That's the first line um, we use to um, estimate causal effects. It's, it's a great instrument. It's our most valid instrument for estimating a causal effect. But RCTs also have distinct disadvantages. Generally speaking, they are very expensive. They are slow to conduct. They usually have small sample sizes that limit their usefulness. They are usually done with highly selected populations for good reasons. All of these things have very good reasons, but it's still uh, a limitation, and they're not always ethically feasible. Generally speaking, very often during the pandemic, RCTs couldn't keep up. We had questions that needed answering, but we didn't, we couldn't get those answers from a randomized clinical trials. That's when observational studies, studies come to the rescue. So observational studies are um, studies that are based on data in which the researcher doesn't get to control the treatment assignment. People do as they do. And from that, we need to uh, estimate causal uh, effects. This makes identification of the causal effects hard. We'll discuss this uh, in a second. And as I'll try to show you, you can only really do it successfully with very, very high quality uh, data, the kind that, that, that integrated healthcare systems generate. Even more so, during the pandemic, we needed answers about subgroup effects. So RCTs generally, because of their small sample sizes, estimate an average treatment effect over the entire sample. And that average treatment effect is assumed by necessity to apply to everyone. It's all we have, so we, we just assume it, it applies to everyone. This, of course, is fine if there isn't a lot of heterogeneity, but as we'll see in one particular example, heterogeneity does exist. Uh, in medicine, and the average treatment effects are just not enough. Observational studies, on the other hand, have to work very hard for validity, but have to get, get subgroup effects mostly free because the sample sizes are usually very, very large, can be in the millions. And if you do have valid subgroup effects, then you can make personalized decisions for people, which, of course, is, is a, great, uh, a great something to have. Okay, so I, I now need to prove to you, if you don't yet believe it, that causal inference for observational data is hard. It's sufficiently hard to necessitate having amazing data to, to do it validly. So why is it hard? And, and I'll, I'll explain all of this with no math notation and no philosophy. Usually at this point, uh, David Hume would be uh, uh, quoted quite extensively in a causal inference course, but we'll do none of them. So what is a causal effect? A causal effect is a contrast of counterfactuals, of potential outcomes. For example, looking at myself, it's what would happen to me if I were to get vaccinated versus what would happen to me if I wouldn't get vaccinated. By definition, if we, if we look at the binary case, only one of those can ever be observed. Either I get vaccinated or I don't get vaccinated. That would mean the other one is counterfactual. It's counter to fact. In real life, what we can observe is just what happens by chance. So just the people who happen to get vaccinated and the people who happen not to get vaccinated. Making the jump from this, which is, as you can understand, not causal, 
to the, um, to the causal effects is the domain of what's called causal identification. Causal identification relies on certain assumptions that are not easily met in uh, observational uh, studies. So let's talk about these assumptions and then dive deeper into the first of them. So the first assumption, and usually the one talked about the most, is exchangeability or ignorability. To put it plainly, it means that the study groups are comparable. They're comparable in regard to their uh, potential outcomes. Now, just think about that for a second. Obviously, with observational data, that's not going to be true. People make, they self-select, they make the decision to be treated, or their physician makes the decision for them because of reasons, reasons that have to be related to their potential outcomes. It doesn't have this assumption doesn't have to be met marginally for the entire population. Uh, we can still do causal inference if the assumption is met conditionally for uh, after having condition on some set of variables. So for example, it might be that we treat the elderly more, but once we condition on age, then treatment assignment within the stratum, within the strata of age is random. That's good enough for us. And as we'll see, that's basically the, the, the the basis of causal inference from observational data. The second assumption is positivity. Positivity means that for each stratum defined by the variables from the previous bullet, we have a positive probability of being, uh, of receiving all the treatment levels. So for example, looking at age, the elderly, some of them do get vaccinated and some of them do not get vaccinated. Otherwise, how are we going to do the causal contrast? We need uh, both sides. The third assumption is no hidden variations of treatment. It means that the potential outcome is, is a well-defined something. So in the regard to vaccination, it would mean that receiving the vaccination leads to a single specific potential outcome, and it doesn't depend on whether you were injected here or here, or if the cold chain was met, or who gave the injection, et cetera, et cetera. The last assumption, and we're going to have some fun with, it, with this one, is uh, no interference. No interference means that my potential outcome only depends on my treatment assignment. So whether or not I have a myocardial infarction and heart attack only depends on whether I take a cholesterol medication. That works well with cholesterol medication, doesn't work very well with vaccinations, which protect me, but also protect my uh, surroundings. So this is an assumption. As, as we'll see, it actually provides some opportunity. RCTs have it easy have it easy in, in, in regard to the assumptions. Exchangeability is met thanks to randomization and any violation is by definition, if randomization was carried out successfully, something that is random and can be quantified using statistical tools. So exchangeability is met. Positivity is true by design. The protocol ensures that uh, everyone, uh, that the, some people do get the treatment, some don't. Hidden variations of treatment are avoided by having very strict protocols that control how the treatment is uh, provided. And interference is avoided by the small sample sizes and by the protocol that says that, for example, you don't vaccinate two people within the same household or within the same school or whatever is needed for this to be met. Now, I had to put this disclaimer here because this is going on YouTube, that RCTs don't really have it easy. RCTs are, are hard to conduct, they're expensive, they require amazing statistical expertise and, and they do have serious threats to their validity that need to be maintained. But they do have it easy for the for a causal identification assumption. Observational studies on the other hand need to try harder, much, much harder. We want exchangeability, we have to have exchangeability. We need to identify using domain expertise a sufficient set of confounders to condition on. We'll talk about that more in a second. Positivity, it, it might simply not exist. It, it is entirely possible that in a certain stratum, everyone was treated or everyone wasn't treated. And then you have a problem. Restrict your study or you know, go do something else. No hidden variations of treatment requires precisely defining the treatment you're looking at. And, and hopefully, you, know, you have enough data uh, to, um, to enforce that. And no interference. Also a problem, specifically with vaccinations, and it needs to be accounted for. Let's see specifically for exchangeability, how we had to handle it in COVID-19 
uh, trial. So this is an example, a classic example of confounding, of a spurious correlation. If we just look at the uh, uh, random variables, ice cream cells and shark attacks, we would see that they are, of course, correlated. But obviously, there's no causal connection. If we stop selling ice cream, sharks aren't going to stop eating people. It's all because of summertime. Summertime causes ice cream cells, and summertime causes a shark attack. So basically, we need all of those, or at least we need a sufficient set of those uh, to condition on to ensure exchangeability. There is probably no data-driven way to find a sufficient set of confounders. It can only occur by domain expertise. So before you even look at the data, you make a cup of coffee, you sit in a dark room and you think. You think what causes the exposure and also causes the outcome. I'm being pretty simplistic, but it's sufficient for our uh, purposes. So we needed what causes vaccination, because we want to study the, uh, uh, the effect of vaccination on COVID-19. What causes vaccination and also causes uh, infection, disease severity, and mortality. And we had a lot of information at this point. We knew that the vaccinated are very different than the non-vaccinated. They are different in demographics, they are different in geographics, they are different in their baseline health status, and we know that all of these things are also uh, connected to the outcomes. Moreover, we knew that these things were changing over time, and I'll, I'll, I'll prove that in a second using graphs. So we knew that there were big differences in age groups in regard to vaccination. Some of those by design, because the government was targeting vaccinations at the first stage to the more elderly. We knew that there were differences by age group with regard to vaccination. We knew, and this is, this is a sad slide that regrettably is still pretty true, that socioeconomic status determines both the rate of vaccination and also the rate of infections. So socioeconomic status is then a clear confounder for which we will have to adjust. We, while all of this was happening, there were societal interventions happening. Schools were being shut down and reopened. People were being put under lockdown and, and lockdowns were ending. So calendar time is a very, very clear uh, confounder that we would have to adjust for. So, we thought about this long and hard, and eventually we came up with this list of potential uh, confounders for which we need to adjust. Now, again, I'm emphasizing this happened before we looked at the data. So it is entirely possible with observational studies that you would think you would come up with a list of confounders and you would discover that you don't measure them. You don't have them in your data set. And either you will find a new identification strategy. There are quite a bit, but you, either they exist or they don't, or you, you give up on the trial and you hope someone else does it better. So this is where the, the amazing data uh, from Clalit uh, really shown because we had all of these things observed. We could either adjust for them or in the specific circumstances when there was still a, there was still a lot of variability even after adjusting for them, we could exclude uh, based on uh, some of them. So our first task for ensuring exchangeability, which is uh, identifying a sufficient set of confounders, is over. We found a sufficient set, but now you need to adjust for them somehow. And adjusting is not uh, trivial. It's something that requires modeling or some other tactic. There's a bunch of ways. None of them is better than others. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. Inverse probability weighting, covariate adjustment, matching, etc. We chose matching. So for each vaccinated person, we matched a very similar non-vaccinated person. Matching is not usually the go-to adjustment method, but we opted for matching because because of several reasons. Well, first, it's, it's technically hard to parametrically model very high dimensional variables, such as the neighborhood in which a person lives that was on the list of confounders. And it's, it's hard to model calendar time parametrically. Matching kind of takes care of that. We very much wanted to stay close to the data. So we didn't want to have to rely on parametric models, which could very well be black box models. Uh, uh, which you know, 
adds another assumption. Now you have all of the causal assumptions and you have another model that needs to be accurate. Otherwise it doesn't work. So that was another one. And the third reason is we really wanted these pretty graphs. It sounds like a weird reason to have, but these, this uh, figure is not from us, it's from the Pfizer uh, phase three trial. And it was everywhere at the time. And rightfully so, because this shows very nicely the separation between the non-vaccinated and the vaccinated. And we knew that we needed this. We needed a figure such as this to persuade people that the vaccine works in the real world setting. Okay, so we decided we want to create a matched cohort, but how do you go about creating a matched cohort? That's also not trivial. Well, maybe it is trivial. Let's just take people who got vaccinated and people who didn't get vaccinated and match them one against the other. Well, this, this, this doesn't work. This is not allowed because this involves speaking into the future. If you only allow a person to be matched as unvaccinated, if he never gets vaccinated, that means you'll always be looking into his future to make sure he doesn't get vaccinated. This causes selection bias. Instead, what you need to do is you need to think like you were doing a randomized clinical trial. You need to think, okay, if I was doing an RCT, how would it look? Well, I'll have a vaccinated. And at the same day, without knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, we need to match an unvaccinated to him. And then on and on and on and on. The problem with this, obviously, is that some of our unvaccinated are going to break protocol. This is retrospective data. They, ain't, they don't know that I'm going to recruit them to a trial that's going to be held in three months as an unvaccinated. Some of them are going to be vaccinated the next day. Uh, so they break protocol and what do I do? Now I have two problems. One is that they are no longer eligible to be controls because they're vaccinated. The second is I lost exchangeability because this guy with his specific age, his specific sex, his specific uh, socioeconomic status doesn't have a matched control. So what we opted to do is to Sensor this guy's data, the vaccinated uh, data, because he doesn't have a control, but to let the unvaccinated the person who is now vaccinated rejoin the study as a vaccinated, hopefully with a new uh, unvaccinated control. And this, of course, can recur over and over and over because the controls can always then uh, be vaccinated. But there is no other way. It's, it's the only way to do it. You need this day-to-day -day, uh, follow-up. Okay, last question about exchangeability. We did all of this. We are pretty proud of ourselves. We thought of confounders. We did this fancy matched court. How do we know it worked? Well, the short answer is we can't. Just like you can't let the data choose your confounders, the data doesn't tell you that there are no more confounders left. The longer answer is that we can't prove it, but we can disprove it by identifying negative controls. And in this specific example, negative control outcomes which are outcomes that are known not to be affected by the exposure. So the vaccine doesn't affect them, but they are plausibly affected by the same set of confounders. If we then not see a null effect for these negative controls, we know we have a problem. But thinking about negative controls is just as hard as thinking about confounders. I mean, there, it, it, it can only happen by domain expertise. Luckily, vaccines have one such perfect negative controls, and that's the first 10 days after vaccination. We know that the vaccine only kicks in after 10 to 12 days. So if we see anything happening in the first days, that would mean we are biased. We have residual confounding. And we use that. And as you can see from this uh, graph, and you, you'll see later, it, it, it was pretty good news. Okay, so I hope I managed to prove to you that causal inference for observational real-world data is hard. Now I'll, I'll we'll, we'll shift topic and having done all of this, having built this uh, study design, let's see some specific causal uh, questions and answers uh, which we answered over the course of the pandemic. So the first one is what we started with, real world vaccine effectiveness. So we knew from the phase three clinical trial by Pfizer that the vaccine is very efficacious, but RCTs are very tightly controlled. Will the vaccine hold up in a real world setting? Well, it did. It actually did so wonderfully. For all five uh, outcomes which we examined, infection, hospitalization, severe disease, and uh, death, the vaccine was very, very effective 
uh, starting from about day 14 and even more so uh, after the second dose. But remember, I said we care about subgroup effects. This is one of the advantages of uh, observational studies. We know that specific vaccines are not so effective among the elderly. Is this also true for the COVID-19 Pfizer vaccine? It's not. We found that the vaccine is effective for all age groups. Sadly, this didn't hold up as well for people with multi-comorbidity, specifically comorbidities relating to uh, the kidney, uh, but also uh, others. This is the kind of information you can really only get from observational studies because you will never have the sample size in an RCT uh, to do it. Second question, pregnancy. Pregnant women are excluded from RCTs generally because of ethical reasons and, and other reasons. But we knew at this point that pregnant women were at specifically high risk for severe COVID-19. Uh, so what do we recommend? Should they get the vaccine? Shouldn't they? Is the vaccine effective? Well, thankfully, we could do this observational trial and we found that the vaccine is very, very effective for pregnant women. And indeed, thanks to this evidence and others, the vaccine is very much recommended for uh, pregnant women. Third question, it's nice that the vaccine is effective for adults against the wild type, the original variant, but pretty soon we had the Delta variant all over the world and we were vaccinating adolescents. Is the vaccine still effective in this group against this new variant? Now I can tell you uh, a year later that, for example, against Omicron, the vaccine is not as effective. But is it against Delta? Well, we found that it is. The Pfizer vaccine is effective against uh, the Delta variant. This was very good news because at this point in time, the Delta variant was doing a lot of damage uh, worldwide. So we showed that the vaccine is safe, but is it, we showed that it's effective, but is it safe? Safety is a particular weakness for randomized clinical trials because a lot of safety signals are pretty rare. And uh, RCTs rarely go above a few hundred thousand. Often you need millions to identify the rare side effects. We had millions and we could do this. We could study about 30 something side effects and we could show that the vaccine is safe for the majority of them. We found two big signals. One is lymphadenopathy, the enlargement of lymph nodes, which is a mild uh, side effect. And we found myocarditis, an infection of the heart muscle, which, which I'll discuss a bit more in an instant. But this is only half the question, right? So these are the threats from the vaccine, but you take the vaccine so you don't get sick with COVID-19. So the second thing we did is we compared the risk from the vaccine with the side effects from a COVID-19 infection. And we found that even for uh, diseases for which the vaccine causes increased risk, such as myocarditis, being infected with COVID-19 is a lot worse. So we could, we could have a pretty complete picture of the safety of the vaccine. So myocarditis is a serious disease, myocarditis in general. It's an infection of the heart muscle that could potentially be lethal. We knew we needed to dive deeper uh, into myocarditis. Uh, so we ran a specific study with myocarditis. It's still a pretty rare uh, side effect. So we could only do it owing to the, um, to the richness of the data that we had. And we found that myocarditis occurs mostly after the second dose. And we specifically found this picture. Myocarditis is pretty rare. It's two for uh, 100,000 people, but it's mostly or almost exclusively in males. And within males, it's almost exclusively in young males. So thanks to this study and others done by others, we could isolate, we could limit the concern to a specific, specific, specific uh, age group. Boosters. Israel was the first to boost before anyone else uh, in the world because Israel was in the midst of a, of a very bad Delta wave and the Ministry of Health decided very wisely to be brave and to give boosters. But there wasn't any evidence at this point. We, we generated the evidence among the first in the world and we saw that the boosters were very, very, very effective. And I think this shows it even better. For each age group, for each color, the graph is the incidence of a new infection and the dashed vertical line is when that specific age group became eligible for the vaccine. And you can see that for each age group, about a week after they become eligible for the vaccine, the, uh, uh, the line breaks and incidence begins to fall. 
the boosters change the course of the third pandemic wave in Israel, probably uh, preventing widespread death and maybe even something that looked at some point like imminent failure of the healthcare system. All of this was about direct vaccine effect. The last thing I wanna talk about before handing uh, uh, the stage over to Noah is indirect vaccine effect. So direct vaccine effect is the, the protection afforded to someone uh, being vaccinated himself. So if I get vaccinated, it's the protection I enjoy. But vaccines, a lot of their magic is protecting others around the people being vaccinated, household members, people you live with. So these are indirect effects, and they are particularly important if you can't get vaccinated. For example, if you are a child under the age of vaccinate, vaccination, if you are immunosuppressed and the vaccine just doesn't work for you. So studying indirect effects is very, very important, but it's also pretty hard. Indirect effects generally happen by two mechanisms. One is, um, for example, look at a person and his children. So you vaccinate the parent to protect the children. How does that work? Well, first, the parent doesn't get sick. He doesn't get sick, so he can't infect the child. The second mechanism is that even if he does get infected, the vaccinated usually uh, transmit less. This is a cartoon we drew to illustrate that. So how are the children protected? The parents either don't get infected to begin with, or if they get infected, they transmit less. Studying indirect effects is hard because we need to take account of a person's community, the people who he exposes and who expose him. But a person's community is composed of his family, of his friends, of his workplace. Those are things that are usually not visible to a researcher at all. This can only be studied in, um, in systems where there is really very, very rich interconnected data. We had this sort of data specifically for households. We knew from previous work by, um, by, by Elizabeth Halloran that we could study indirect effects by just looking at households. Households are a very important, um, a lot of COVID-19 transmission occurs within household. So just, just by looking at a person's household, we could uh, study uh, the indirect effect. Now, like I said at the beginning, Clalit can draw a family tree of all of its insured population. And families usually uh, aggregate to one sick fund. So if the child is in Clalit, the parent will usually be in Clalit and vice versa. So this allowed us to study indirect, indirect effects within a household. How did we do it? We took households that had two parents and at least one child under the age of uh, vaccination. And we looked at the infection rate of the children as a function of how many parents were uh, vaccinated, zero, one parent, or both parents. And we found that uh, we did this for two different periods, either an early period for the alpha uh, variant or a later period for the delta variant. And we found that vaccinating both parents reduces the rate of infection for the children by 70% in the early period and 60% for the late uh, period. This was consistent across child's ages. So this was true for very young children, but also for adolescents. And this was uh, consistent across household sizes. And this is, this is big news, right? I have two children under the age of vaccination. I can protect them even though they can't get vaccinated by the virtue of me being vaccinated and my wife being vaccinated. I can lower the probability of infection by 70%. That's amazing. If the vaccine alone did 70%, just by virtue of the direct effect, we would be pleased. And we can achieve that with an indirect effect. This wasn't enough for us. We wanted to understand the mechanism. Like I said earlier, either the parent doesn't get infected or it doesn't transmit, which is it? The answer is it's both. So obviously we knew from the direct effect that vaccinated parents get infected a lot less. The vaccine early after the second dose is about 90% effective also after the booster. But we found that in, uh, vaccinated parents transmit a lot less, which is very important because it means that even if the infection manages to get into the household, there is still a smaller probability that the children are uh, affected. So this is the uh, final result. This was recently published in uh, Science. And um, 
this sums up everything I talked about for the early period. One last word, well, semi one, one last word, that's privacy. Privacy is the elephant in the room when we discuss the amazing interconnected data that um, healthcare systems have. It is a simple axiom that maintaining patient privacy is of the utmost uh, concern. I didn't talk about that, though it definitely deserves uh, discussing, but you should know, as we discuss this, that there are many, many layers of protection uh, for research like this conducted on, on, on this kind of rich data in Israel. There, is, there are institutional review boards and there's anonymization, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I felt this deserves some talking about, but we can talk about it more offline if, if anyone specifically wants. So just before I hand over the stage, the interim, the interim summary at this point is that the pandemic is raising a lot of causal questions. Answering these questions, RCTs are, 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 are not enough. We need high quality data that is extensive and immediate and that the integrated structure of healthcare systems is allowing such research. Yeah, we'll do it together in the end. Um, okay, so Noam discussed how we can inform medical knowledge, and that is uh, lots of times done through uh, quantitative models of causal inference. And I'll be talking about how we uh, actually try to promote care to actual patients through uh, prediction models that are aimed to do predictive, proactive, and personalized care, um, which is we think better than the care we can provide today. So first I need to convince you that we do need to provide some better care than, than, than what we uh, can with the means we have now. And in order to do that, I'll show you some statistics. So first of all, some statistics uh, state that cause of the, the third cause of death in, in Western countries and specifically in the US is healthcare errors. It's, it's not consistent ac across all statistics, statistics. It kind of depends on how you calculate these uh, cause of death uh, lists, but some uh, mention this as a very major cause of death. 30% of care that is given is futile and has no net benefit. So we want to avoid it because it may do some harm. And 45% of the care that should be given is not given. Just to put some specific numbers because these seem very high level, uh, how do we compute such a percent like 45%? So for very specific examples, only 66% of patients with established cardiovascular disease, that means that they already sustained something like a heart attack, receive statins to lower their cholesterol and they all should be given this treatment. Only 25 to 50% of hypertensive patients achieve appropriate blood pressure control. And only 30% of those with history of osteoporotic fractures actually receive treatment to prevent the next fracture. And you should know that osteoporotic fractures may not seem like such a dangerous outcome, but uh, if you sustain specific fractures, your risk of dying in the next year is higher than most types of cancer. So it is something we really want to prevent, but still only 30% are receiving the right treatment. So we have a problem, but, but why? If we understand why, maybe we can help solve some of the problems. First problem is that the information the, in the medical literature grows exponentially with time. So it is estimated that in the 1950s, the medical literature basically doubled over every 50 years. So it means that someone graduated from med school back then, they were pretty much good for their entire career. That changed over time gradually. And it was estimated that in 2010, the medical literature doubled every four years. So now consider that med student, that poor med student that needs to uh, study everything up to date, what happens just throughout the course of his or her training. And it is now uh, estimated that the medical literature grows or doubles every few months. So it's not all uh, like actively affecting uh, 
patient's treatment. Some of it are a lot of papers that are less relevant, but the relevant part grows really, really fast. And no human brain of any medical doctor, no matter how smart he or she is, can handle these kinds of information, even if they sat all day and only read the literature instead of treating patients. The, that, that's not the only thing that grows exponentially with time. The other, other thing that grows is the amount of information within the patient's record. So uh, when we had paper records, once in a while, we put everything in the archive. Now everything is digital. Once it exists, it stays forever and the information accumulates really fast. And for a specific medical decision uh, in this year, maybe a specific lab test that was recorded 13 years ago is relevant for a specific medical uh, decision that I need to make today. The chances that I'll know and remember that piece of information when I need to make this, this decision, crossing it with all the literature that we just saw is, is pretty slim. And this is not just for one medical condition at a time. A lot of patients are suffering from multiple medical conditions. And these statistics from Clarit actually shows that after the age of 45, more than half of the population have at least one chronic condition. And as age uh, increases, this rapidly increases to many, many chronic conditions. And luckily, the population is aging because uh, we have better life expect expectancy. So we have many, many more of these individuals uh, with multi uh, comorbidities to take care of. And all of these uh, factors go into a situation in which we have pressing and burning issues in healthcare. The first is that the ideal care compared to what we would expect with the up-to-date literature and all of the information from the patient's records and all of his or her condition, medical conditions is getting further from the ideal because the ideal is almost unachievable. And the second thing that happens is when we try to handle all of these conditions and all of this information and all this overload, it's getting harder and harder to uh, focus on preventive care because we focus on what's already happening. So like, uh, lifting our heads above the water and looking into the future and, and asking ourselves what we should try to prevent, uh, which outcomes we should prevent for any patient becomes uh, harder and harder. And when we think about it, it's not one condition for, for a specific patient that is now healthy, it's dozens of conditions or hundreds of conditions and which one should we focus on? So that means that our ability to focus on preventive care uh, is decreasing over time. But we think that we can do something about it. And if we won't do anything about it, uh, we'll have a problem and we can't just go on the way we did healthcare until now. We need to change something fundamental in the way we're giving healthcare. And I can tell you that uh, the way we give healthcare uh, as opposed to other areas in life has not changed dramatically in recent, in, in, in recent years or decades. It's pretty much the same, uh, but we think that now we have the opportunity to really uh, bring in some new changes that could dramatically change the situation. And this, these changes could be smart use of data and quantitative models in order to really improve patient's care. So let's start with the first problem that we saw, the ability to focus on preventive care. Preventive care is the most effective care. Uh, it's the cheapest. It's, it doesn't have side effects usually. Uh, it doesn't prolong the patient's life uh, in a few years or, or months. It, can bring them years of healthy living. Um, and it's really the care that we want to provide. But how can we try to prevent numerous chronic conditions from happening in the future when we don't know on which patients to focus and on what conditions to focus? And here is where predictive models can really help us because predictive models can take many, many, many data points from within those medical records that we've discussed and try to integrate them together into a prediction that identifies specific subgroups that are at a, at a high risk for deteriorating towards a specific condition in the future. And this could be done separately for different conditions, identifying different uh, populations for intervention. So this, this uh, potentially uh, could be done using those thousands of pieces of information, but the human mind is not very effective in such tasks. Uh, not even the doctor's minds. 
And uh, if you look at this picture, uh, I imagine that most of you are trying to find Waldo by now. Uh, and maybe some of you found one or two. But if we ask a computer to do this, it happens in a split of a second and with uh, full accuracy. And we don't ha even have to uh, take any effort. So we think that when we try to look at patterns and many, many, many uh, data points and identify patients that are prone to deteriorate in the future, prediction models uh, and AI can really help us do it. And let's look at one example uh, and dive a bit into it. So hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is a condition caused by a virus uh, called hepatitis C, uh, which infects the liver and is considered to be the first cause, the number one cause of, of liver cancer and liver transplants in the US. Um, this is a virus that can be contracted in several manners, but the thing about this virus is that once someone contracts it, they could become silent carriers of this virus. And then over many, many years, their liver gradually deteriorates until one day they can get into liver uh, uh, um, failure and need transplant or either develop liver cancer. So this is something that we really want to treat, but um, unfortunately, until not so many years ago, the treatments were pretty horrible. They had horrible side effects that were compared to chemotherapy. They were giving uh, through injections and only 50% of those who took the, these medications actually recovered from the virus. And a few years ago, something that is really no short of a miracle in modern medicine happened and new diseases, uh, new medications were actually uh, identified and developed to, uh, to, to cure hepatitis C. These uh, new medications are given uh, through pills. They don't have almost any side effects and their cure rate is over 95%, sometimes even more uh, over 98%. So amazing treatment. And this brought the notion that maybe this disease can be, can be eliminated from the world. And the WHO basically created a plan of how this disease will be eliminated by 2030. The problem is that only 50% of the individuals that are chronic carriers of this condition are aware of that. And 50% are, are what's called silent carriers and no one really knows that they're sick. So in order to identify these individuals, we need to screen them and the, the WHO asked uh, each country in the world to come up with a screening plan to identify uh, HCV, HCV is hepatitis C virus, HCV patients that are uh, uh, silent carriers and could be treated and, and basically cure their virus. So this happened in Israel as well. And the group of experts uh, basically sat and identified the most um, fundamental risk factors for being a silent carrier of hepatitis C. And those uh, factors included three, being a former resident of a country in which HCV is endemic, uh, people who received blood products prior to 1992, the year that they started screening uh, blood products for hepatitis C, and IV uh, drug users, uh, because that's one of the ways this virus is transmitted. And basically, uh, being computer science uh, crowd, at least part of the crowd, this could be plotted as a decision tree, as an algorithm. But this decision tree is a very, very uh, simplified decision tree with only one split of either you belong to group A, B, or C, then you should be screened. Otherwise, you should not be screened. So most of the population will not be screened and their probability of being infected is indeed very small, but a pretty, pretty substantial part of the population should be screened, 10% in this case, uh, and their probability is, is higher, but still pretty small. And this begs the question, can we do better with all this information and all with all of these new models that we have? And in order to answer that question, we took a retrospective cohort of over 300,000 individuals who were not screened to, uh, for hepatitis C until the year 2010. And we checked which of these patients will be tested in the future and what happens to them. And we found that 0.5% uh, of those who are tested actually are found to be silent carriers of hepatitis C active carriers that should be treated. And now we can basically do what we want to uh, in order to use of all of this uh, data 
to cross uh, many, many, many uh, data points regarding uh, lab results, diagnosis, medications, whatever you can think about from the patient's record with the outcome of interest, put it into a machine and try to come up with a model that will identify patients who are very prone to be tested uh, positive if they were to be tested. And this is what we got in the first iteration. This is again, a decision tree, but it's much, I think you will agree that it's much more sophisticated than the uh, decision tree that we initially had. And it's a white box model. So it has the advantage that we can actually see what happens in each node and understand why each patient received a recommendation to be tested. These are the red nodes or not tested. These are the blue nodes. And if we enlarge uh, some of it to be able to read uh, some of the var variables, you can see that the first splitting nodes are actually the, the, those that were identified by the experts as the most uh, uh, relevant criteria for screening. So it means that something logical is happening here. We, it seems like we can trust this process because uh, I can tell you that medicine is not really used to using such, such models usually. And it, it takes a leap of faith in order to trust this kind of model to use variables that are not listed in the medical literature in the medical textbooks as risk factors for, for, risk factors for hepatitis C. And we can take another leap of faith and not use this white box model of a single decision tree, even if it's more sophisticated than the original decision tree. We can actually grow many, many such trees, in this case, 43 trees using uh, what's called boosting uh, decision trees uh, algorithms, XGBoost in this case. And then each patient basically travels throughout all of these trees simultaneously and getting an even ac more accurate prediction than the single decision tree. So let's see how it works and if it works and if it's, it's worth all the hassle. So we said that we have uh, a prevalence of 0.5% uh, in individuals uh, that are currently uh, silent HCV carriers, and we want to identify these. And in order to do that, we are willing to do some screening. And let's say that our prediction model told us to screen 6.6% of this population. So if the model was a random model, theoretically, we would expect to find 6.6% of, of this red slice, right? If it's completely random, so we will find 6.6% of this red slice. But the algorithm is obviously not random and it's effective. And it turns out that the overlap between the yellow slice of the screening and the red slice of the true positives is very uh, large. And even though we screen only 6.6% of the population, we can actually identify 72% of the silent carriers. Uh, and that's something that seems very effective and, and worthwhile. Uh, and just a note regarding this process of, of screening. So screening is done uh, for many conditions, breast cancer, colorectal cancer. Uh, you all know it because it, it will be relevant to all of you at some point in life. And you should know that many of these decisions in medicine are basically those simplified decision trees, which we could maybe call decision stumps because trees is maybe uh, and like overstating it. But this process of gradually increasing the decision complexity towards decision trees that are more complicated and eventually towards forests of trees uh, seems very logical, but it's something that the medical community needs to uh, grow accustomed to and gradually uh, trust. And this is the kind of thing that we are trying to put into uh, daily healthcare in Clelit. And we think that it's much more effective. And if we address the, the challenges that we've started with of how uh, healthcare systems are basically uh, overburdened today, these kinds of models can really help us to identify the very specific subgroup of patients for which the preventive care or preventive measures will be very, very, very effective. And uh, again, this is the kind of care that we really want to practice. So with that, uh, we can't not talk about COVID. So at the March uh, of 2020, uh, the beginning of the COVID pandemic um, in Israel that took, took a few months until it got to, to Western countries, uh, policymakers in Khalid basically came to us and said, 
you know how to do all these prediction models, we really want you to help us identify, evaluate individuals' risks for severe COVID-19, uh, because we think it will be effective towards all of these proactive measures that we want to take in order to defend these uh, populations that are at high risk. Uh, the only problem was that we didn't have COVID-19 data in Israel at the time, and we just discussed how basically what the computers are good at doing is taking a lot of data points and crossing them with a specific outcome in order to identify a pattern. But the, here we don't have the outcome, so what do we do? So we won't get into um, detail, but as a very high level process, uh, what we did is basically to create a predictor for a different outcome, but a related outcome, or we, at least we thought that physiologically it's a related outcome, uh, and that outcome was severe respiratory infection uh, illness. So we thought that if we identify patients who are prone to these conditions, maybe we can try to tr transform this predictor later to be some kind of a COVID-19 predictor. And it actually made a lot of sense because we saw that the, uh, this predictor uh, came up with features that are very uh, relevant and make sense medically. And then basically what we wanted to do is to adjust these prediction outputs to specific case fatality rates of COVID-19 that came from China in those early days. And the way we did it is through uh, uh, some joint work with people who sit here in the crowd uh, of multi-calibration, which is uh, an algorithm taken from the fairness domain, but it actually came in uh, pretty handy in this situation to translate this initial predictor into a COVID-19 predictor. A few months later, uh, we, we changed that predictor to, to, to train specifically with COVID-19 data because we had that uh, on the time. But this predictor uh, actually was pretty useful in the, in the few, first few months of the pandemic in Israel. Just to uh, convince you that it actually works. So some statistics about its effect, uh, how its performance. So we basically defined two uh, risk groups of the clinic population. One is the very high risk group and the second is the high risk group. So the first marked in red here consisted of only 8% of the population, but was able to identify 73% of those who ended up deteriorating if they contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the high risk group consisted of 15% of the population, but was able to identify more than 90% of those who will deteriorate. So now we have a group that we can uh, very effectively uh, manage and try to prevent the condition and maybe treat it better. So let's see what we did for prevention. So in the very few uh, first few weeks after we developed this predictor, uh, 200,000 individuals who were the very high risk group actually received personal phone calls from their clinics and care providers, which they know, telling them how they should be careful of this new disease that they don't know and what, what should they do. Uh, the high risk group and the very high risk, risk group also received uh, SMS messages with personalized uh, content regarding their high risk and how they should uh, try to avoid this disease. And also they were prioritized for some home accessible services such as uh, delivery of medications to the home instead of to uh, going to pharmacies. Once patients were unfortunately uh, infected with SARS-CoV-2, patients that were defined at the very high risk group, even if they were triaged to be treated at home, were actually uh, favored to go into inpatient care because uh, we thought that it could help uh, prevent their, their deterioration. And more recently, actually in the very in last month, when not only COVID-19 vaccines got into our arsenal of treatments, but also treatments uh, both, given both uh, through injections and through uh, pills, to prevent deterioration once the patient was infected were also prioritized on a daily basis through these kinds of models. So every morning uh, we would distribute lists to physicians throughout Klali, throughout Israel, stating these are the patients that were infected yesterday. These are the ones in the highest risk. Please proactively call them and invite them to, to receive the medication if it was uh, through injections or not invite them, actually go to their house and give them their injections or send the pills to, the, to their house and explain how they should use uh, the medications. So uh, again, these kinds of, of prediction models, once they stratify the population, help us be much more effective and be uh, much more um, accurate in the efforts that we do make uh, to prevent 
conditions. And these uh, models throughout the last two years were constantly translated into a simplified models for the public use. So these are point-based models that are obviously a bit less accurate than the more expressive models, but could be used by each, pa each patient uh, to calculate their uh, risk count and under understand why they are defined to be at specific uh, risk groups and what's the implications. Uh, this model is actually very, uh, um, it actually was published and not published, published within Clalit in the last couple of weeks because it's the first model that we've integrated uh, that actually has uh, factors of protective factors and not only risk factors, uh, giving your uh, vaccination at the time since the last vaccination and whether or not you were previously infected. So again, each patient can calculate their own uh, risk count on the left and then I know uh, which, uh, so this is for internal use, uh, if we want different cutoffs for different interventions based on the amount of resources that we have, but then we know how many of those uh, uh, patients we identified to be uh, at high risk and how many of these, if they will contract the disease, will actually deteriorate. Uh, and we see uh, the trend, a very clear trend based on the amount of points. So these kinds of, of models, uh, we talked about two of these. Uh, we have many more that are actually informing care on a daily basis, trying to make it more preventive as we discussed. But each of these, the implementation of each of these is basically an uphill struggle because the EMR system, the electronic and medical records are legacy system. It's very hard to change them. It's very hard to bring these kinds of, of outputs to the point of care at the right time uh, for the physicians. And uh, basically in the last year or so, what we're trying to do is to create platforms that will break this wall of integration and implementation. And uh, we create uh, this platform CPI, which uh, stands for Clelit Proactive, Prevention in, uh, Pro Proactive Preventive Interventions. And this is a basically uh, a patient management platform to promote this proactive and personalized care. The way that it's done is that basically each physician receives intervention lists from multiple conditions. Uh, for example, now we're seeing a list for the prevention of osteoporotic fractures. This list is prioritized based on the predicted risk of deteriorating towards that specific medical condition. And physician actually gets two hours a week, which is a, like protected time in their calendar to do these proactive uh, interventions, not wait for the physicians to go through the door, but actually uh, uh, getting to, to them. And this is also done in, in a holistic manner, not considering each medical condition separately, but considering multiple such conditions simultaneously. Uh, and for each patient, considering their specific predict predicted risk towards uh, different kinds of medical conditions. So we talked about the ability to focus on preventive care and how we can help these, uh, the, the, this task through quantitative models. But we also talked about the problem and the, the very large challenge that we have uh, with the gaps in care that are starting to uh, increase over time uh, with the care that patients actually receive compared to the ideal care uh, that should be given according to the, up -to -date, the most up-to-date literature that no one can really keep up with. Uh, and this is a problem throughout the world. And here, again, data can come into our help and we can utilize data in order to narrow these gaps in care. How can we do that? We can take expert physicians, the expert, best expert physicians in each specific domain, and basically try to create clinical pathways for the entire process of uh, screening, uh, follow-up treatment of patients in that condition. And these pathways can be very, very, very detailed uh, and to the degree of detail that corresponds to the most up-to-date medical literature. And then basically we can take patients and make them travel through these pathways and gather their personalized recommendations every night automatically for the entire uh, healthcare system. So imagine 4.7 million individuals traveling throughout these very detailed pathways for multiple conditions every night, collecting the most up-to-date recommendations. So these will be given tomorrow morning for the physicians to try to make their care more close to the ideal care that they should receive. And these kinds of outputs also go into such platforms 
So now we look at a specific record for a specific patient, uh, showing all of the relevant information for a specific medical condition and all of the specific personalized recommendation for laboratory tests, referrals, treatment, and additional recommendations for that specific condition for that specific patient. And basically, it translates to uh, that uh, primary care physician that used to sit alone in the clinic. Uh, so imagine that now behind uh, this physician's back, we have the most up-to-date and the most expert cardiologist that was, uh, that, that was chosen by the med that, but from the entire medical system as the one that should define these guidelines, and the most uh, expert endocrinologist, and the most expert nephrologist, and the most expert cl uh, clinical pharmacist. Uh, true story, because these are the kind of, the kinds of experts that we have for this system right now. And now she's not sitting alone anymore. Now she, ha she has behind her back the best medical advice for a specific patient uh, personalized and up to date. And with that, we think that we can make the care better. We can make it more accurate, narrow these gaps that we talked about. We can make it more proactive because we can focus through prediction models on the right patients. We can integrate all of these information into specific platforms of information and to integrate it into the point of care at the right time for the right patient. Uh, and with that, maybe we can help these uh, very burning and pressing issues we have in healthcare. And with that, we'll finish. Thank you for both of you for an amazing talk and also for all your work. And I'm going to open it for questions for the person. Amazing work, both of you. Thank you. So one question is for your streamline. How do you evaluate? I would think that will work, but you still need. Yeah, how do you evaluate the this system? Uh, what's the like the control in a way? The intervention or yeah, the with, with, with all this new system of clinical aids. Okay, so it, so it's a very good uh, question. The the holy grail is what's called the learning healthcare system that integrates these kinds of tools and continuously. Uh, measures how they are effective, so they could keep upgrade and only keep up keep the the interventions that are most effective. Uh, this is the holy grail, and it's called the holy grail for a reason. And uh, there is almost no healthcare system that gets to that yet. For us, this is very new. So I just showed you the most up to date things that we do. We really hope that in the next uh, couple of years we'll be seeing uh, results, and we could uh, use both causal. Um, analysis in order to see the effects that these interventions took, but also uh, maybe use some more sophisticated manners. And specifically for things like the HCV screening, it's, it's easier because we can see how many patients we send uh, to be screened based on the algorithm and how many of them uh, basically turn out positive. And that's the most easiest case that we have because we have the answer really readily available within a few days or weeks. A lot of the conditions are very chronic in nature, so the prediction will uh, be for 10 years at a time. So it takes time to know whether we got it right or wrong. It's, it's more of a chronic nature uh, of a thing. So we need to be patient and we know that we have to measure uh, because that's the holy grail and really want to do it appropriately, but we're at the beginning of the process. Does it make sense to ask patient satisfaction as a surrogate or proxy? <laughs> So it's a question. It's a good question whether uh, patients will uh, know about this system, how many physicians. So some physicians, uh, the, the system is now starting to be you know, implemented. So some physicians tell, them, tell us that with the right patients, they actually uh, turn their screen and share the, the outputs together with them and they can see it. I imagine that in many of the cases, that's not the case. Uh, it's, it can never be 100% uh, accurate. It does, it's a decision support system. It's not a decision maker. The data is never 100% accurate. We can never uh, replace the, the physician's judgment. So it's basically uh, for the use of physicians and not directly to patients. Uh, but it, it, in cases where the outputs will reach the patients, it's really interesting to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Both were really interesting talks and I have questions to both of you. Uh, so to Noah, um, and this follows up on Bin's question about evaluating, like you said, this is a recommendation. 
It's not forced. I have a former student who did some research with a algorithm that helped managers and call centers determine who to interview for a job. And those managers that followed the recommendation, they ended up interviewing better people than those who didn't. Now here you have experts and it would be interesting to see if those who don't follow the advice are actually better at making decisions or worse at making decisions. And if there's some heterogeneity, I don't know if you've looked at that, but that would be quite interesting. So it is, it, it's, it's a brilliant idea. And actually a lot of the things that could be more uh, readily available for, for evaluation is the adherence to recommendations and not the long-term outcomes. So that's something that we'll uh, definitely uh, mean to follow, to follow up with. And we hope that they will adhere, but actually it's all very, in the very few months of, of deployment and it's gradual deployment, so it will take some time, uh, but we really hope to see eye adherence and to understand for those who do not adhere, why? Is it that there are better physicians and they know better? Do they think that they know better, but they don't really know right. better? Um, or just they don't have the time? And, and To Noam, uh, when you talked about the um, uh, indirect effects, right? Uh, now, obviously, like you said, you're making assumptions in the lack of an RCT. Um, one question about that data is whether the parents who were vaccinated are also behaving differently in ways that you can't measure. So for example, parents who choose to get vaccinated, they may be more risk averse. As such, at home, they may empl employ more, uh, you know, like separation. When, when someone gets sick, they put them in a separate room, whereas parents who don't get vaccinated, they just are more cavalier about it. So in what way do you know, or are you confident, I guess, you can't know, that indeed you're able to control for these idiosyncratic preferences? So behavioral factors are very serious potential confounders for vaccine effectiveness. This is known that there is extensive literature about it. There is no easy way to deal with it because we don't directly measure behavioral tendencies. However, we can use surrogate. So for example, we adjust for uh, previous vaccinations, for example, influenza uh, vaccinations. We adjust for how many times a person goes to see their general physician, which is a surrogate for health seeking behavior. You can't, there is always going to be residual confounding, it's unavoidable, but we think you can capture a lot of it and you can, you can use things like negative control outcome to know that there is no disaster going on. You didn't miss something horribly big. Oh, well, I really enjoyed the talk. It was very inspiring. Um, I was wondering, did you guys think about building in um, also uh, recommendations for like uh, proactively um, collecting data that would help um, your data set be more um, uh, like maybe miss things that you didn't see? So I, I think right now um, you talked about, you know, using the machine learning techniques that kind of fit what you're seeing in the data set, for example, like the HCV like you, there is a 5% that was, detect, you know, that, that was uh, detected, but there could have been a, a different subpopulation that just happened to be less tested because of the policy that was used to gather the data. And, um, and that would not be able to be detected by the uh, ML method. So I was wondering, yeah, if you guys thought about the aspect of like complementing the data in the active way. So the answer is yes, um, less, less in the way that you refer to, like sending uh, patients for uh, screening for when we don't have a good reason just to see, to get a better representation of the, of the population and its different subgroups, uh, but more in terms of, because it's, it's just logistically very hard and very expensive. And as we said, healthcare systems and including today, but all of the healthcare systems are very highly burdened as it is. Um, but we really want to augment the data with things outside of the medical record. So we know that the medical record has specific types of data. And as we see, it is fortunate to be, to be very rich in data. Uh, and the, the, but still, this kind of data is not very uh, online. So we have lab tests that are done every few years or every few months, uh, we have some conditions that are being recorded, some consultations, some complaints, but we have a lot of um, uh, IoT devices today that collect many, many more uh, data points. We really want to be able to uh, create infrastructures in which we can uh, suggest patients to use these 
and, and ask them if they're willing to contribute to this kind of data in order to create uh, models that are maybe more online in nature and are more granular in data. Uh, I can also tell you that we're trying to do this uh, not only through sensor, but sensors, but also through, for example, imaging. So for example, a lot of patients are, are undergoing CT scans uh, for all sorts of reasons. These CT scans get a glimpse into your body and you can collect a lot of information from that CT scan. But basically today, most of the uh, reports basically just say whether they found something very major or whether for the specific complaint that the CT was done for, they found something or not. But if a patient is being screened for whatever, uh, for a CT and that CT happened to, to uh, take uh, a glimpse of their heart, we can see whether they have what's called uh, calcium, uh, uh, um, it's called a calcium score, whether they have calcium deposits in their coronary arteries. And that's a major risk factor for cardiovascular diseases, more than any risk factor that you know, like hypertension or cholesterol or whatever, because that's like the end point. So even if that patient did not have yet a heart attack, we know something very substantial that now is currently not used by anyone. So we are trying to integrate AI system that uh, go through these scans to find these uh, opportunistic uh, findings and then integrate these opportunistic findings into these kinds of system in order to inform the, the position better throughout the, all of the information that we can collect. So all of this gathering new types of data and new types of information is definitely something that we're trying to do, but it's much harder and it takes time compared to using what we already have. And also maybe um, since we spend a lot of time today thinking about like algorithmic fairness, was that something that you guys have thought about when designing these systems or if we're aware of looking at, you know, if the mm, current healthcare procedures are maybe not currently fair and whether the system would exacerbate that? So we can, so the answer is yes, because we are fortunate to work yeah. with some of these guys here. Um, but it, it's, it's, we can spend an hour uh, discussing it. It's not that straightforward in medicine because in medicine, many of the factors that are considered protective variables are actually things that we can't ignore. So uh, sex and sometimes race is, is a big issue, whether it's, it's a genetic marker or something that is biologically relevant or maybe more a so social marker of healthcare utility. Uh, but it's so it's things that we need to consider. And I think uh, Guy showed this morning how we can improve models through these kinds of, of algorithm, but it's not that straightforward as in different in domains like hiring someone from a job, which is real, it's obvious that sex is not, should not affect it. If we're trying to um, think about also protic fractures, obviously uh, sex is something that's obviously very important because uh, females are much more prone. So the answer is yes, but, but the long answer is that it's complicated. <laughs> I have a question. Oh, is there somebody else there? No? No one? I just want to have a quick one. Uh, I'm going to move back. Uh, so I was struck by this, uh, what you said about the fact that we cannot digest all this information coming our way. You know, the papers, the records, and so forth, which sort of indicates also as a secondary thing that people who are more literate or that follow the literature more or maybe. Uh, and are close to someone, uh, you know, I think about these value systems, there's always someone you know who knows someone and, and they tell you what to do, right? So people are more connected to the sources of knowledge, I would assume are better treated or because they kind of follow their own, they take things matter into their own hands. Speaking of fairness, uh, I wonder if there's any model of that. I know that in financial things, they have actually records that if you know, you sort of do investments as people close to you tell you what to do. So if you are asking your local butcher how to invest versus someone who works on Wall Street, there'll be different outcomes. It's very, very true. No, I'm sure the graph that, that basically uh, illustrates it for, for COVID-19 vaccines, right? Because the, the populations with a higher socioeconomic status get more vaccines, even though the healthcare system in Israel is, is public, everyone can get it freely and very are very encouraged to get it. Still, some get it more, and, and it, 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 it's not, uh, it is related to, to healthcare disparities. Um, being a public healthcare system, uh, throughout the years, Khalid implemented a lot of, of narrowing the gaps kind of uh, interventions, and these were very effective in narrowing gaps uh, for, I would say, 
processes like getting mammographies and getting uh, uh, colorective cancer screening uh, tests. They are less, so there are still gaps in, in the more hard outcomes of the actual um, adherence, not just to the process, but for the outcome measures. So for example, uh, for uh, things like how well you are uh, with your controlling your diabetes, which is harder than just taking a screen, we, we still see some gaps and we're, the, the health, the, the entire healthcare in, uh, system in Israel is based on like the, the opening sentence of the public uh, health law is that this law is based on uh, values of equality and, and, and things like that. So the whole system is very geared towards narrowing these gaps, but unfortunately they still exist. And even for the life expectancy statistics, you can still see some, certainly some differences between subgroups in the Israeli population. And, and in the time, it's not an Israeli kind of thing, it's, in, it's in, in the entire world, but we do try very hard to narrow it. But interestingly, it seems to me that more information they widen it rather than narrow it. But no, do you see what I'm saying? Uh, more information available to people in, in some groups, even though the intention is good, uh, the outcome is interesting. I think will probably widen the gap rather than the other way around. So, obviously, uh, healthcare literacy is something that directly affects it. I think it's it's uh, it's a given. But uh, these kinds of systems, when they bring the expert opinion to the periphery and make it available as it is for someone who sits in the center of Israel, uh, I hope will help narrow these kinds of gaps. But um, there is no magic cure to such things. It's a lot of hard work and. So equitability is another outcome that needs to be evaluated for these interventions. And I, I agree with Noah. I think it will it will improve the equitability of the healthcare system, but definitely something that deserves to be studied as part of this intervention. One thing that is clearly equitable in Israel is the mistakes <laughs> in mortality are equitable across. Uh... So my last question is. When you mention about the CT scan, doctor say only take because they care about my knee, and then they find something in like the egg wouldn't find something uh, in my heart. So this is kind of against the Western medicine philosophy, very compartmentalized kind of philosophy. The foot doctor doesn't care about the knee, the knee doctor doesn't care about the heart. Do you think the AI approach, because the access to the global information, will help the medical establishment to move more like a holistic philosophy? So I think that once we take these holistic approaches and the data-driven approaches as the example so that we've had with the CT, so if they will scan your knee, they, they will not know anything about your heart, but if they scan something in your lungs, maybe just closer, they will see something and could use it. So, and, and as you see, these, these kinds of systems integrate many medical conditions together and many medical, many medical experts together. So I think the answer would be yes, but to be proven. Thank you. So I think it's five o'clock and thank you very much for a fascinating talk and for coming to talk to us. Thank you.